Why don't we pray, Father? I pray this morning that as we come around your word, that you be lifted up. I pray for each and every person, be it here, be it online, because there is no distance in your kingdom. And wherever they are seated, be it on their couch, on their bed, or right here in this room, I pray your word will not return void. I pray that it will produce what only it can produce. I pray that hearts would be open, minds would be ready, and that eyes would be opened as we enter this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 8, verse 22 on. It says, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? Turn to the person next to you and ask him this question. Do you see anything? The wives are like, thank you, Pastor Alvin, for giving me the opportunity to ask that truthful question to my husband. Verse 24, he looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Verse 25, once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. I want to talk to you this morning from the topic, miracles in the hallway. Miracles in the hallway. In fact, I was struggling. This is what you do when you can't come up with a title. I, I put my title online on Instagram and some of you voted on what the title should be. And so I'm talking on miracles in the hallway. Miracles in the hallway. You might be wondering, what does that mean? But I want to talk about what a hallway is. A hallway is something that takes you from point A to point B, from room A to room B. Are you with me? From a hallway is, is anything that connects two spaces. Uh, a hallway is, is a bridge. A hallway is a ladder. A hallway is a connection. In fact, as I was driving here on the highway, in many ways, I felt like I'm in a hallway connecting from suburbs to suburbs and point A to point B. A hallway. And I think so many times we don't understand this, but the reality is we don't live in rooms. Most times in life we live in the hallway. We want to be in rooms because rooms give us certainty. Rooms give us assurance. Rooms give us confidence because if I'm in that room, I know what to expect in that room. We pray room kind of prayers. God bless me with that job because if I get to that job, a.k.a. room, I get to enter Thank you, Tristan. A, B, C. We, 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 uh, we pray, uh, jaw, we pray prayers like God, that relationship, that marriage, because if I enter that marriage, aka room marriage, I will have X, Y, Z as a result of that. So we pray, pray room kind of prayers. But I find in scripture that we don't just have a God of the room, but we have a God who specializes in the hallway. Most times in life, we're in a hallway. You might be in, 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 in the sense in one area, you might be in a room, but in your mind, you might be in the hallway. You're, you're positioning from here to there. You have left here, but you're not there yet. And, and, and so you're not sure how it's going to work out because you seem like, it seems like you're stuck in the hallway. And so miracles are not necessary in the room. Miracles are most necessary in the hallway. But a lot of times we pray ourselves out of the hallway. I want to be in a room as opposed to be in a hallway. Why do I want to be in a hallway? A hallway only provides for a point of connection from one place to another. But yet what you got to understand that the nature of God is God specializes in taking people out of rooms, positioning them in hallways so that he can do only what he can do in hallways. It seems like God cannot do what he can do in rooms, but he can do a greater work in a hallway. So if you're in this place, I know it seems like I'm speaking in parables, but if you're in transition, you know exactly what I mean. I think this message bears resonance to our souls because so many of us have had changes in work, changes in health, changes in travel plans, changes in holidays, changes in making the ability to make decisions because it seems like the world has been in a hallway. 
And so this message bears more resonance to us than we realize. We can miss the hallway because at the end of the day, it's just the... We can miss it because we're just going from point A to point B. When I'm walking from room A to room B, I'm thinking about room B. I'm not thinking about the... You're getting along. So you got to understand this. But what you need to understand is it's in that point between A and B that God does his deep work. And so you got to understand this because now I've come to realize the power of this. And I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. But I'm sort of giving you where we're going to this morning because I want you to already buy in to the dialogue of this message. And then begin to realize the elements or the instruments that Jesus uses in this passage. So let's read it one more time. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. They came, who came? Jesus came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Verse 22, it says, He took the blind man by the hand and led him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him. I've read this hundreds of times but I didn't read it the way I read it last night. He took the, bl my, the bl blind man by the hand and led him. Blindness is a sign of the inability to see. Blindness is the lack of vision. Blindness is the absence of sight. Blindness is the understanding of you're living in a place called the unknown. Blindness is the gray area. He takes someone who is blind who is living in a dark place and leads him to another place. I find it interesting that Jesus should have healed him before he took him. But he refuses to heal him, but holds him by the hand and takes him. The Jesus I know should heal me as soon as he meets me. The D Jesus I know should rescue me the moment he is in 1.5 meters apart from me. The Jesus I know should, should rescue me. He is preached as the rescuer. He's preached as the savior. He's preached as the healer. He's preached as the deliverer, but does not do anything what he's called to you, me. So in a sense, there was no difference between anything Jesus did and any other human being did to that man. Because all his life he was held by the hand and led to places. But the thing that I like about the story is what it informs me is something that I never realized. That I thought I could only be led by Jesus if my eyes were open. So I pray for my eyes to be open so that I can be led. But he refuses to open my eyes and still lead me. See, some of you have downsized this moment because you cannot see. But what you got to understand is God is leading you. You've come to this place feeling like you cannot see and you're not even sure why you're here. But the fact that you're here is because God led you here. You're not sure how you ended up in that job, how you ended up in that relationship, how you ended up in that dynamic. You're praying for breakthrough. You're praying for freedom. You're praying for redemption. You're praying for wholeness. You're praying for salvation. And you're praying for your eyes to be open, not knowing that God is still leading you by his right hands even when you're still blind. Which is why Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was leading us on before we ever arrived on planet earth. Why don't we thank God for a God that leads us. But now, now when I read what Paul says in the book of Acts, when he says, we were led by the Spirit. I used to pray, God lead me like Paul. Lead me to the coffee shop. Lead me to that place. Lead me to that country. Lead me to that church. But today, I've come to realize that when Paul said he was led, he was actually saying he was blind. <laughs> because you cannot be led unless, you do not need leading unless you cannot see. Because if you can't see, you don't need leading. You can just walk ahead. And so when we pray prayers like Jesus lead me, you know, you meet people that say things like, I, I meet people, and, and, and we've got to be careful because in the 21st century, we've given language to things that we, uh, that we, we have spiritual language to indecisiveness. Have you ever met indecisive people in the church? I'll tell you what I mean. Hey, I need you to help me with this. Well, I'm just praying for a leading. 
I'm just praying for a direction. I'm just waiting. So many times we use language of this nature to, to muck up an excuse for something that we do not want to do, not realizing that that very posture of being led requires us to be blind. So if you're blind this morning, congratulations because you're about to be led. And if you are praying to be led, take out your eyes. Could it be that in the middle of our needing for a miracle, in the middle of our need for a breakthrough, us positioning ourselves at a place of humility is actually the posture of being led by the Holy Spirit. It's when Paul said, I want to go to Asia, but I cannot go. And so the Spirit leads me here. He, he thought that's where he needed to go, but he could not go. And due to his lack of ability to see ahead, I don't know if this is bearing resonance with anybody, but I think I'm preaching to a generation that is struggling to see. And the reason why you're struggling to see is not necessarily because of any decisions you've made or the lack of, but because of the circumstances around you where it seems so difficult to make a decision. And it seems like we're blinded. I cannot make, someone was asking me the other day, how is church going? And I have great dreams and great visions, but really I can only plan a month ahead because I cannot see. And, and, and so we live in this place, and so we pray prayers like, God, open up my eyes so I can see. Give me the gift to know what is happening next year. But he refuses to open our eyes, but yet he chooses to hold our hands. Which tells me that I can still serve God when I cannot see. Which tells me I can still go after the things of God when I'm not fully restored. Which tells me that in my serving, I am restored. In my following, I am whole. In my, in my dependency on Jesus, despite of my inability to see, I am being useful for the things of God. So many times people negate the will of God because they think they cannot see. And so you're here this morning and you feel like until I fix this in my life, I cannot be of use unto God. Until I get rid of that, I cannot be of use to the kingdom. I want to break that dialogue. I want to break that lie. I want to break that theory. And I want to tell you, God can use you despite of you. <laughs> he can use you in spite of the blindness. And so in spite of his blindness, God leads him. He's led by the hand, even though he was blind. You know, the thing is, the reason I say this is because so many times we have timelines. And the reason we create our timelines is by comparing our timelines. I want God to use me. Let me think about five other people God used that way. Wait a minute, all those five people God used, God did this, 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 and they had a pet chihuahua while God used them. So that's what I need. So we go out there and buy the chihuahua on eBay that somebody's getting rid of. And we try to dress up like them and we try to date like them and we try to live like them and we try to go to the places like them because we think if we have their life, we can be chosen by God. But yet God is saying, live your life in spite of the blindness you carry, in spite of the disability you bear, and allow me to lead you in, in, instead of comparing your timeline with somebody else. And so that is what is happening. Jesus chooses to, heal, to, Jesus chooses to lead him before he heals him. Are you willing to be led by God before he heals you? Are you willing to follow God before he delivers you? Because so many times we hear people say, when, when he heals me, I will follow him. When he does this, because we've already, we already know the end in mind because we've defined room B. I'm in room A, but I know I need to be in room B. And I'm in the hallway, but, but, but my focus is so much about getting to room B, not knowing that he's leading me in the hallway. That there are miracles in the hallway. And it begins to change everything. Let's keep reading verse 23. I've got a lot more to talk. Verse 23 says, he took the blind man by the hand. And where does he lead him? He led him outside the village. Because sometimes before Jesus can do something in you, he needs to take you out of you. Sometimes before God can do something, he needs to get rid of your surroundings. I mean, think about the pain that Jesus went through. He took him out of the village before he could heal the person. He took him out of his 
familiar grounds. He took him out of his friendship circles. He took him out of his relational situations. He took him out of what he was comfortable with. And over these last couple of weeks, we've been talking as a church about praying and fasting and worshiping. And the reason we are pushing that hard in this season is because we're giving people access to go and do something different. It's not that every day we are fasting, so let's do something different. What were we trying to do? We were getting out of the village. What's my village? My village is Netflix. My village is school drops. My village is following the soccer. My village is PS4. One day PS5 in Jesus' name. My village is all sorts of things around me. But there are times and seasons when I need to get rid of my village. Not disown it necessarily. Not say it's bad. But just get out of it so that God can do something in me in the hallway. So many times we want breakthrough while we're in the village, but sometimes God needs to get rid of the scenery around us so that he can create the substance within us. So he takes him out of the village. It's almost like Jesus is preaching a message to us. He's saying, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of that which you know. Get out of the, you got to understand. It was not that the village was bad because if you read the story, it says the people in the village brought him to Jesus. They were good people. I wish I could say the people were bad and get out of that relationship, get out of that. Sometimes good things can come in the middle of God things. And God was taking him out of a good thing and taking him into a new place. And he was taking him to this place that seemed awkward. You know, whenever you're starting to do something new, it feels awkward. For us, some of us this morning coming here was awkward. Some of us haven't been in church for a while. It feels awkward. It's new territory. New territory feels awkward. Uncharted waters feel awkward. But here's the thing. When a baby is about to take its first step, it also looks awkward. But you know what? When you take that step, there's something great that's being birthed. There's a new step. There's a new habit. There's a new thing. There's a new shift that's taking place. And I want to give you permission to step into the awkward this season. Hallways are awkward because it's like the hallway is great, but no one sits and chills in the hallway. But, but I want to give you the moment of chill for, for, for a minute in the hallway. I want you to find the awkward spaces between point A and point B. Because I think God is changing some of our surroundings to produce what we need for the season ahead of us. And if you're in this room, I want to speak to you. I want to encourage you. And I want to tell you that maybe you're doing something new and it feels uncomfortable. It feels inconvenient. It seems exciting at the same time because it looks different. But it just feels a bit unusual. I want you to buy into the unusual. I want you to buy into the awkward. God's been doing a work in me. He's been asking me to do some things lately that I haven't done in a long time. Things that I'd never, never stepped into for over a decade. He's saying, I want you to do that again. And you know what? It feels awkward. It feels unusual. And maybe that is where some of us are, but I want to encourage you this morning and say, step into that because now he's in a new place. And that's how some of you feel. Some of you feel like you've lost things. See, because what you're going to understand is when the blind man left the village, he lost things. He lost familiarity. See, this doesn't seem like a big deal to you. You're like, oh, Jesus, and he's going for a stroll, right? You don't, I don't know much about blindness, but one thing I do know, you don't take a blind man out of his comfort zone. It's dangerous. It's lethal. He, he knows the way about his way in the village. But if you take him to a new place, that's dangerous. It's a liability. And so some of you have lost jobs, you've lost friendships, you've lost relationships, and you're looking at the loss that's happened, but the loss that you're experiencing is because Jesus has put you in a hallway and he's doing a deep work in you. So if you feel like you've lost, you haven't lost, which is why Paul says for me to to, to, for me to preach is gain and not loss. And you got to understand this, that the losses that you faced, just like the blind man, the losses that you faced. I, I want you to picture this. The blind man could have heard about the story of blind Bartimaeus. I want just having a little bit of a detour. Blind Bartimaeus, great story. Jesus looks at the guy, you're healed. Blind eyes open. Great, right? I'm sure he would have thought, what can't, why, why can't I pick from the menu and pick Bartimaeus right now? Can you do a Bartimaeus on me, Jesus? Why take me on a walk? And then it gets more complicated. I'm not even going to go there. Takes saliva, puts it on the guy's eyes. 
There were lots of sermons last month about it, so I won't even go there. And so, and so all sorts of crazy stuff is happening. I mean, this guy is going through the process, but you got to understand this, that sometimes God will drive us to, a, to, to, to drive us to a deeper place. He will take us to a new place. He will put us in a new surrounding. And it feels like you've lost. And it will feel like you've failed. And it feels like nothing is come to get, to, coming up together. But I want you to understand that if you are the person going through that, you need to understand that you're in the hallway and your position for a miracle. Are you with me? Verse 23, he says, He took the blind man by the hand, led him outside the village, and he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. Jesus asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up to make matters worse. He's taken him out of his village. He's got saliva dripping on his face. And then Jesus, the Son of God, prays for him. And the miracle does not even properly work. So he looked up and he said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. This guy has become a zombie. <laughs> He's gone from the guy who was blind to the guy who's not even healed. Could, have been, could there have been a thought in his head that, this is not what I signed up for. Because you, know, you got to understand, he doesn't technically qualify as fully blind. you got to understand, in that culture, blind people had privileges. They, they, they had certain CDs, their people gave, there was generosity. He had lost his privilege and hadn't yet entered his blessing. And I feel like that's where 99% of the church lives. Jesus saves. Jesus heals. Jesus cares, but it's better, but it's not what I thought it to be. It's, it's awesome, but it's not. I know I'm getting real candid this morning, but maybe that's what you need to hear. I, I, I thought this Jesus deal, hit. I had a different idea. I heard the story of Bartimaeus, and I thought it would be so easy. I saw how you raised Lazarus. I heard about how you raised Lazarus from the dead. It was so easy. That time they suspended someone from the ceiling and you just said to the guy, walk up. And he just got up and started walking. I mean, why, why is all this complex thing happening? I'm, I'm trying to look, but I cannot see. But you know, the danger is most of the church will fake it. You will say you were healed when you were not healed. You will say you were blessed when you were not blessed. You will say you were whole when you're not whole. Because it's almost like we live in this day and age where like we feel like we've got to keep up the reputation of Jesus. Can I tell you something? God was here a long time before mine and your arrival. And he will be here a long time after mine and your departure. The greatest danger I face in the church is when people act spiritual when they're actually struggling. And, and, and there's this disease in the body where if you're in church for six months, now you've got to sound spiritual. You've got to have, you've got to be a part of this Bible study. You've got to have, you're on the partner program with John Bevere. You've studied moon interpretation from John Hagee. You've bought the shofar. You've bought the flag. You've been to the conference. You're wearing the t-shirt. Hillsong sends you the CD before anybody else gets the CD. You know what I'm saying? But the truth at the end of the day is when you open your eyes, you see men walking like trees. And you will not say it to a single soul because you are the leader of the young adults for Jesus saving Morton Bay community. They, they tell me that when people get quiet in church, that's when you're speaking the truth. Pastor Elwin, what do you see for Downport Church? I see a church that's big. I see a church that's influential. I see a church that's, uh, you know, doing great things for the glory of God. I see a church reaching the schools. I see a Bible college. I see people coming and being raised up. I see people on our platform. I see worship ministry. Pastor Elwin, what do you see? Oh, what do I see right now? Oh, I was just talking about room B. 
what do you see right now? I, I see volunteers walking like. I, I, and, and this is the tension that I live in where God has given me vision. But sometimes I cannot see it. The blind guy had vision. The reason I know he had vision was because he went to Jesus. He went to Jesus because he already saw himself healed. He already saw a better tomorrow. He already saw a better future. He already saw room B. But somewhere between room A and room B, stuck in the hallway, he sees men walking as trees. And there are so many of us that live in the zone, but will not confess it. Dare I say that if Jesus would have come close to some of us and he would ask us the question, how you doing? We would say, blessed and highly favored. This guy is a champion to me because he was audacious enough, yet humble enough and transparent enough to look in the eye of the guy that raised the, raised the dead, healed the sick, cleansed the leper, and say, I'm not fully healed. Can we, can we have a generation that's willing? Now, the problem with our generation is we will play, we will fake it in church and fake it with God and jump on social media and tell everybody all the trees that we've seen. That's the problem with our generation. Can we have a generation that will go to God and say, God, I don't see what I'm called to be seen. I don't know if you're going to use me. I'm not sure if this is going to happen because I think there's a picture on the inside of me. But when I open my eyes, I see men walking as trees. Can I give you permission to live in that tension? See, we want to be super spiritual before God and true before man. But can I give you permission to be true to God? Be true to Jesus. Tell him where you're at. So many times I've had to go before God and I say, God, I see great things for our future, but I don't see it right now. I, I see you're going to do amazing things, but I'm not there right now. And I'm okay with it. I'm not going to live in the hallway of disappointment. I'm going to live in the hallway of tension. I'm going to live in the hallway of prayer. I'm going to live in the hallway of seeking you. I'm not at B, but I'm not going to go back to A. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to go after you, God. And I'm going to be open, and I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to be humble, and I'm going to go after you, because if you are in the room with me, that's all I need. Here's what you got to understand. If this guy was never healed, he never had to be concerned. Because Jesus was holding him by his hand. And if you're in a season where you're not there, yes, live, pray, believe, hope, fast, imagine, focus, create, be inspired, worship, but know who is with you in between. The author and the finisher of the faith is not going to leave you stranded. He's not going to leave you hanging. He's there. He's the Lord that never leaves us. He's the Lord that never forsakes us. In fact, I'm preaching to somebody that's right now in the middle of a transition and you feel like you've been stranded and I want to prophesy over you that the Lord will let, never let go of your arms, of your hands. He is there. Surely you will lead me. Surely your rod and your staff, they will com comfort me. If you believe that, why don't you give God a shout of praise right now? He's our ever-present help in times of trouble. And so we've got this guy who is, who is in between miracles. He's in the hallway. He's in between. He's lost the privilege of being blind, but not entered the blessing of being able to see. And, and, and I love this story because there's a story, in, another story in the Bible of another guy that got, that got blind. And his name was Samson. Samson did all sorts of things, wasn't the best leader, had a few addictions, and the story finds him tied to two pillars. He's about to die, and his hair is going to grow back because for whatever reason, there was some story to it that when his hair was long, he had supernatural strength. And so there's this moment where they're about to kill him, and he says, God, anoint me one more time. 
anoint me one more time. And what I love is I can see the faith of Samson with the faith of this guy where he goes to Jesus and he says, one more time, pray for me one more time. Touch me one more time. Pour your spirit upon me one more time. And I want to give us permission, Downport Church, to pray a one more time prayer. God, I thank you for speaking to me then, but I need you to speak to me now. God, I thank you for touching me then, but I need you to touch me now. God, I thank you for giving me fresh vision then, but I need fresh vision now. One more time. God, I need a new anointing. God, I need a new grace. God, I need your new mercy. God, I need to experience your love once again. God, I need your presence once more time. God, I need your oil to pour upon me. God, I need a touch from you. Is there anybody else in this room that's feeling this hunger, that's audacious enough to stand on their feet and say, God, touch me one more time. Touch me one more time. One more time. One more time. But church has climatized us. To play it when we are dead. To play it when we are drowning. To play it when we are dry. To play it when we are weary. To play it when we are offended. To play it when we are betraying. To, to play it when we are dishonoring. To play it when we are disloyal. But I am praying for a church that will open up their eyes and say, I see people, but I see them walking like trees. I see people, but I see them walking like trees. You know what is amazing is... Jesus prays for this guy and he doesn't get healed. You know what we would do in church? We would do a Bible study on 15 reasons why the man wasn't healed. 72 reasons why he had to touch him twice. We will Instagram Nathan Finocchio asking him, why wasn't he healed? See, the question is not about why wasn't he healed. The question is about the fact that the blind man touched him one more time. We will do commentaries and Bible studies and Jewish doctrinal understanding of why did Jesus, but why the mud? We will take the mud that Jesus touched to the mud that Moses touched when he was doing the Ten Commandments. We will link it up with the stones and the pebbles that David found. We will live amongst the mud but not rise up to the surface and say, I don't care about the doctrinal reasons as to why he had to be prayed for a second time. All I know is whoever is hungry, hungry they will be filled. And if, not, if, I'm not hung, if I'm not satisfied yet, I have the privilege and the opportunity and the invitation to go before God and say, one more touch, one more touch, one more time, one more word. And so we have this tension where he says, God, touch me one more time. And then in verse 25, it says, once more, oh my gosh, the breakthrough, the potential, the grace that is in the scripture. There's somebody in this room that came to hear this this morning. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eye. Once more. It does not matter what last week was like. It does not matter what the last two years were like. Once more, he is willing to stretch his hands towards you. He's willing to touch you once again. He's willing to heal you. He's willing to forgive you. He's willing to touch you with His grace and His mercy. He's willing to take away the shame. He's willing to take away the guilt. He's willing to take away the pain. He's willing to take away the betrayal once more. Once more. Once more. And then it says the sight verse 25, was restored and he saw everything clearly. How many of us would love to live in the clear zone of God's will? Everything clearly. But then he says something that I've never read before. Verse 26, Jesus sent him home. Don't miss this. Is it on the screen? No? No? Hopefully, can we have it on the screen? Maybe it can't be on the screen, but verse 26. The team wants you to be extra spiritual and open it in your Bible app. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. He takes him out of the village, puts him in the hallway, puts saliva on his face, asks him what he sees. It doesn't work properly the first time. 
lays hands on him one more time, he can see, and then tells him, don't go back to that village. Don't go back to that village. The Jesus that the church has taught me is the kind of Jesus that would take me out of my village and the next morning when I wake up and I'm back in the village would again take me out of the village. The next morning when I wake up, I'm back in the village. He'll come and take me out of the village. But that's not this kind of Jesus. He says, you stay away from the village. Because the nature of God is he does not want robots. He wants people led by his spirit. He says, I will lead you for the first time because you cannot see. But now that you can see what is in the village, you know your way around the village. You know your way about the village. See, so many times this is why people never graduate into the next stages of their life because they want a rescuer. They want knight in shining armors rescue me from the village every day. Now, if you've been back in the village, that's okay. If you're back in the village, that's okay. There's grace, there's forgiveness. But what God wants to produce in you and me is the finite ability to have incredible vision and clarity that we will be able to navigate the seasons ahead of our life. He's looking for people that have sensitivity, people that have intuition. This is the difference between God. This is the difference between Jesus and any other God. Every other God would have loved you to be, oh, I need you. Oh, no, no. He says, I've given you sight. Now you know your way. And you know what he's telling to us this morning? I've given you my spirit. Tarry in Jerusalem until you've been filled with the power of the Most High God. For when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will lead you into all truth. He will lead you in the hallway. He will lead you in the valleys. This is a shouting moment right now. He will lead you through that cancer. He will lead you through that affliction. He will lead you through that pain because my spirit will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that powerful? That we serve a God who cares. We serve a God who fills us with his own spirit, who gives us intuition, who gives us insight, who gives us understanding. And I want to pray for people this morning because maybe this message bore re resonance with you in different points. And maybe you're here with every eye closed in God's presence. And you're saying, that spoke to me. That spoke to me. That spoke to me. That spoke to me. Maybe you feel like this guy. You can see things, but you cannot fully see. And as your pastor, I'm the first one to say, there are some days I wake up and I see clearly. There are other days I wake up and all I see is trees. And so I need to go before him and I, I got to go, say, Jesus, fill me. Touch me. Minister to me. I worship you. Fill me with your spirit. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. If that is you right now with every eye closed and you're saying, that spoke to me. Include me in that prayer. Just lift your hands right now across the room. You're saying, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. That's me. Hands going up across the room. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. Just going to give you a few more moments. That's me. That's me. In transition. That's me. Thank you. That's me. That's me. Why don't we say this prayer together? Jesus, I thank you that you're the Lord of the mountains, but also the valleys. You're the Lord of the rooms, but also the hallways. And I believe that there's breakthrough, that there's deliverance, that there's miracles in the hallway. Open my eyes so I can see. Show me your ways so that I can know and teach me your path so I can be led in Jesus' name. If you're in this room with every eye closed and you're saying, you're sharing all this, but I feel far from God. I feel far from Jesus. 
I feel like I've lost this relationship with him. I, and I feel like I don't even know my way back. I feel, I feel like that guy blind and I'm, I'm at this place where literally I need him to hold me by my hand and lead me out. Lead me out because I can't walk this thing on my own. If that is you, I want you to just lift your hands right now. You're saying, that's me. That's me. Include me in that prayer. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand. Anybody else is saying, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Let's say this prayer together. Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Take me by the hand. Lead me out of my lifestyle. Come on, louder. Of my sin, of my shame, of my guilt. I put my trust in you. I believe you. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. From this day forward, I'm never the same. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name.